Thanks for everyone joining today. Um, my name is Fiona McClellan and I am a Senior Associate in the Employment Team. And we have my colleague Kerry with us today, Kerry Norville, who is a Legal Director in the Employment Team. Um, and the session today is going to be on neurodiversity in the workplace. And then we are also going to cover some recent interesting cases from the last couple of months. So before we get started, just the usual housekeeping points to cover at the start. So can we please ask that everyone keeps themselves on mute during the webinar? Um, if anyone does have any questions, if you put them in the chat section, then we will pick these up at the end of each section and we'll um, have a look at them and provide answers. Also, just so everybody knows, this session is being recorded and the recording will be shared with everyone after. Um, so, you know, obviously, if you want to take notes, but um, don't worry about that because we will be sending out the recording. Um, so I think that's all the key housekeeping points to cover. So we can move on to the first topic and I'll be covering that. And that is in relation to neurodiversity in the workplace. So as you'll have read in the summary for the webinar, it is estimated that 15 to 20 percent of the population is neurodivergent. However, currently the majority of businesses do not have a set agenda for attracting and retaining neurodivergent employees. And today we're going to discuss potential ways to help businesses to build an inclusive workplace for neurodiverse workers. So studies have shown, and I think that it is now widely accepted, that there are numerous advantages to building and retaining a diverse workforce. Diversity and inclusion is on many companies' agendas and undoubtedly great progress has been made by many employers in this area over recent years. However, there is a pool of talent and potential that the majority of employers are still not attracting and employing, and this is a neurodiverse community. So, what do we mean by neurodiversity? Now, neurodiversity refers to the different ways our brains process information. So neurodivergent means someone who thinks differently from the way the majority, who at times refer to as neurotypical, expect. It's an umbre umbrella term used to describe alternative thinking styles such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, autism and ADHD. And the Neurodiversity Business website, it has a quote that states that neurodiversity describes the amazing variety in human neurology, thinking, communication styles and expression. Those typically excluded are a wide spectrum of neurodivergent conditions, characteristics and expression, including conditions such as autism spectrum condition, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia, dyscalculia, development language disorder and dyspraxia. And by embracing neurodiversity and the contributions every kind of mind can make, businesses unleash long-term potential benefits that enable their teams and their people to make an impact that matters. Now, I'm sure most of us in the webinar today will have friends and our family members that are neurodiverse or may be neurodivergent. And I do also think it's important to emphasise from the outset that everyone is different and no two people are the same. And if people have the same condition, it may display differently. Um, and therefore, it's important not to make assumptions about people. Every human has a unique cognitive approach. And also that most neurodiverse conditions will likely be considered a disability under the Equality Act. This is, of course, fact sensitive and a legal test, not a medical test. But it's important to remember that many neurodivergent people may not identify as being disabled despite being legally covered by the Equality Act. So the quote from the Neurodiversity and Business website that I just read out, it specifically touches on the fact that by embracing neurodiversity and the contributions that every kind of mind can make, businesses unleash long-term potential benefits. 
Now, an individual who I'm sure we're all familiar with, who recognises the benefits of having a diverse workforce and the importance of embracing the different ways of thinking is Richard Branson. So Richard Branson is himself neurodiverse. He is dyslexic and he has ADHD. So Richard Branson's view is that more than ever, we need more we need new perspectives, different ideas and broader ways of thinking to solve the big problems of our time. And he is a strong supporter of diversity and inclusion generally in the workplace. And for example, you can see this from many interviews he's given over the years. And if you're familiar with the current um, Virgin advert currently running on TV, you know, he makes clear in that that he, he supports um, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So. So how can other businesses follow Richard Branson's lead and attract and retain neurodivergent employees? Because a workplace will clearly benefit from different perspectives, ideas and ways of thinking. And this does emphasise the importance of having a neurodiverse workforce and the fact it can help a company flourish. So approximately one in seven people in the UK are neurodivergent which means that all of us are likely to be working with colleagues and our clients who are neurodiverse. And in terms of neurodivergent employees' experiences in the workplace, recent studies have, pro have provided really quite depressing results. So um, only circa 40% of neurodivergent employees report a positive experience after disclosure in the workplace. Approximately 50% of neurodivergent employees have actually left a job after being treated badly by colleagues and only half of managers openly openly state that they or sorry half of managers actually openly state that they would not employ a person from specific neuro minority groups so i think we can all agree that these statistics are not good um, and we need to look at what can be done in the workplace to improve these statistics now the first area to consider is the recruitment stage. And this actually can often be one of the biggest hurdles for people. For example, only 16% of autistic adults are in full-time paid employment. And this is despite the fact that, that the majority of autistic people want to and are able to work. So looking at the recruitment stage, things for employers to consider at, at this stage would be, for example, job advertisement. So, I mean, I think we will all know this, but traditionally the lists of essentials and nice to haves and a, and a job advert can be long. And to be honest, often everything listed is not actually required for the, role, for the role. So if job requirements are too long, it might put neurodiverse people off from applying and then and they may also rule themselves out due to one specific requirement listed. For example, you know, you see things like amazing communicator, excellent team player, um, and, and that simply having one or two um, things listed that, that somebody doesn't believe that, that, that they, they are, it might actually just put them off um, applying. So employers should, they should think about what's actually needed for the specific role and ensure the job description matches that. And does not just also contain lots of additional requirements that are not actually necessary. Um, employers could also make clear on the job advert that you have an, an inclusive approach. I know, for example, on our vacancies here at, at Burness Paul, there's a reference to recognising everyone is different and valuing those differences. Other things to consider about when it comes to recruitment is that you know you could have a, a website statement so on, on the company website you could include a website statement of commitment to neurodiversity you know as a business if you want to be attracting neurodiverse talent then it will help you then it will help if you're known as a company that embraces neurodiversity and understands the benefit of different ways of thinking you know people will be likely be more encouraged to apply for a job if there's a website statement of commitment to neurodiversity and I, I think it's quite common that um, you know we would all probably do this if you were thinking about applying for a job you'll, you'll log on to the website of the company and and see what it says so I think if you have a website statement there that then that would be helpful regarding commitment to neurodiversity also at the recruitment stage there's obviously the interview process and you know consider the format and the questioning so I think at an interview stage be open-minded and try not to make quick assumptions and be aware of unconscious bias. 
Um, like for example, traditionally in an interview, eye contact is viewed as important. And this may be something that a neurodivergent interviewee would struggle with. Also consider the questions being asked. Um, an autistic applicant may find it difficult to answer questions that are very general. You know, you could, like the classic interview question of, tell me about yourself. Um, or also questions that are not clear. And I know one that I've been asked um, that may fall under this category would be, for example, like, tell me a time when you dropped the ball. You know, so, so think about the questions that are being asked. Um, and also to, to, to support interviewers, the people that are doing the interviews, you know, consider if interviewers could be given neurodiversity training and training to the wider workforce is something that I will touch on later. Um, also consider and, and be open to adjustments in the interview process, for example, allowing a neurodiverse applicant to have access to interview questions in advance or allow a support person to attend the interview um, along with the interviewee. And also in relation to, recruit and to recruitment, consider the nature of the application process. So ensure that any assessments that form part of the interview um, are neurodiverse friendly and consider if any adjustments could be made. I know that ACASH recommend that when individuals apply directly to an employer, having online applications with spelling and grammar checking software can reduce barriers for, dys for dyslexia and accommodate those who find computer-based communication easier. Um, if the application process includes a time test, that can be a huge barrier for a dyslexic applicant, so consider allowing more time. And it is, it's also best to be upfront regarding the interview format so there's no surprises on the day of the interview and that also allows an applicant to request an adjustment if required so if an applicant has disclosed a diagnosis then you could check in with the applicant and ask if they would like to request any adjustments so I do think it's good to be um, open and upfront prior to the interview regarding the format and, and what the interview will consist of and also if the company is open and inclusive in their recruitment process, then an applicant is more likely to disclose and share a diagnosis and, and feel comfortable in doing so. Now, of course, there's, there's no legal obligation for an applicant or an employee to disclose. And some people may choose not to for various reasons, um, but people probably feel more confident about doing so um, if the company is open and inclusive in the, in the recruitment process. Now, another thing to touch on just before we go any further is that I think one thing that, that, that is really important is that you do not use a person's diagnosis as a starting point or take a stereotype approach. Because as I mentioned earlier at the outset, it's important not to make assumptions and recognise that everyone is different and take a people-centred approach, a person-centred approach. So, the next stage following recruitment would be starting the role. And I think for most people, starting a new role is exciting, but it's also nerve wracking and it's also a really uncertain time. So at the start of employment, you know, it, it's recommended that, that you would have an open discussion. So if, the, if an employee is disclosed that they are neurodivergent, then have an open conversation with the employee and ask the employee if there are any adjustments they want to request or if there's any areas of concern. I, I think some people are nervous to have these conversations, but I think it's really important to be open and, and, and speak and speak to the um, speak about it and, and, and check in with the employee. Um, it's of course important to be understanding and compassionate in any of these types of discussions. Um, and an employer should always, of course, treat disclosure with sensitivity and discretion. I think also it's really important to have a clear induction. You know, it'd be helpful to have a really clear induction and consider any potential adjustments that you might want to make to that process. You know, I know when, when, when people join and it might be really busy and you want to have that time to, to do a clean induction, but there's so much else going on, you don't quite get the opportunity to do it. You know, I think to make the time at the start and have a clear induction um, will be really beneficial. And, and it's not just about you know the, the the role but also about how the um setup of of the 
the building and you know where to go for lunch with toilets just everything like that, that 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 is best to be clear from the outset so I think that's really helpful and also the relationship with a line manager will be important so I think it's really important to encourage catch-ups regularly and try to have open and honest conversations especially um when the employee is starting in this role when this this will help to address any issues at an early stage. So I think that that's really helpful at the start um, of the employment. But once in role, you know, it's important to consider if there's any workplace adjustments required for the employee. Um, and many adjustments are free or inexpensive and are actually really quite simple to make. But these can make a huge difference for the employee. And within the neurodiverse community, differences may include information processing, sensory sensitivity, social and communication skills, and simple adjustments can make a huge difference. And I think sometimes when we speak about adjustments, people are going to think, oh, they'll be expensive or, or they'll, they'll, they'll be cause a lot of upheaval. But actually, a lot of adjustments can be put in place freely, like don't cost any money and are quite simple to make. So touched on this earlier but one of the most important things is to have open and clear communication with the employee ask for feedback and check if the employee has any requests or if there's anything specific that the employee finds challenging you know an employer should not make assumptions and adjustments and for example do not take the approach that because an adjustment was made for one employee um with Tourette's and it should be made for all employees with Tourette's because we actually recently last just last week we had an internal webinar on neurodiversity and an interesting statistic that was mentioned was that despite many people often thinking that if you have Tourette's that means you you know you walk about and you're swearing but this actually only impacts five percent of people with Tourette's so it is important to take a person-centered approach and not make um, assumptions when looking at adjustments and that's something that you know I can really stress in in relation in relation to the approach taken. So adjustments. Let's consider some adjustments that that could be put in place or could be considered. So one thing um, is to consider is the office noise and lighting. So it's very common now for an office environment to be open planned. I know our offices are open planned, and certainly when I I speak to um, clients and friends, most people seem to be in an open planned office today. So as we all probably know from, from working in that type of environment, you know, it can be noisy and there can be various separate conversations occurring at once. And this can prove really quite challenging for neurodiverse people who may be sensitive to sound. So an example that was given to me was that someone sitting behind you, you know, tapping on a pen all day, can, it, that can sound like an automatic drill. And an easy adjustment would be making available noise cancelling headphones. I'm sure we've all seen them, you know, the kind of like um, big headphones that you, you, can, you can wear or having a designated quiet zone in the office. So like, for example, you know, in trains, sometimes you have a quiet carriage, you can have a quiet zone in the office. Um, so that's an easy adjustments to make. Also, in terms of means of communication and provision of information, that should be considered. You know, the employee and manager having clear guidelines of what support is available and ways of working is important. So if the manager is providing an instruction for a task, discuss and agree how that will be communicated. For example, if you want that to be written in an email rather than at the end of a Teams call with various people on the call and all giving instructions at once. I'm sure we've all been probably in situations where you're on a, a Teams call with various people and you're given various instructions what, what we want to do is follow up and it might just be as simple as saying look the approach we will take is when we decide to follow up actions put the manager will put that in an email and send it to the employee um, so I think it's about again having open dialogue about that and, and what, what would be helpful and what would work best can also consider in terms of adjustments um, any technology that can assist so if an employee is dyslexic then text-to-speech software could be made available um, other things that people might not necessarily always think about would be like being flexible in relation to start and finish times. You know, consider being flexible and um, when an employee starts or finishes to allow the employee to avoid traveling at busy times, which which can prove, sometimes prove challenging, for example, for an autistic employee. Um, I've also touched earlier in adjustments about the open plan office, but, you know, with the open plan office, quite often 
everybody also has hot desking. I know that's certainly something that, that we have. So you, you, you sit at a different desk most days. Now, some people may, may find that a challenge and, and prefer to have their own seat. So that's another simple adjustment you could have. Like you could have say, designated seats for individuals so they don't have to worry about hot desking. Um, other adjustments you could consider would be actually adjustments to the role. So you may agree with an employee but they don't have to do certain aspects of the role. It could be, for example, a client facing work or if they don't want to answer phones. Because I think what we need to you know, remember is it's about building on strengths and trying to remove barriers. So if there's some aspects of the role that the employee would struggle with and this can be removed, then consider doing this. Um, and of course, you know, we've I've talked about them, the recruitment stage and, and, and the start of employment and then moved on to adjustments here. But, you know, it might not always um, pan out that way. And an employee may disclose a diagnosis during the course of their employment and also only may only receive a diagnosis during um, the course of their employment. So I think it's also about employers being open to adjustments at all times during the employment relationship and, and remembering that and keeping it under review and, and having that open dialogue with their employees. So along with considering adjustments, um, one of the other factors that is key to building an inclusive culture and a positive experience for your neurodiverse workforce is also raising, a ways, raising awareness across the whole workforce. And by doing this, this will, this will help build understanding, compassion, and also acceptance in the workplace. Um, and the reality is, unfortunately, still some people make wrong assumptions regarding neurodivergent staff. Um, you know, unfortunately, some managers believe, you know, employee lacks capacity or would be a burden on the team. And, you know, obviously that's wrong. And, and by educating the whole workforce, that can prevent these wrong assumptions being present. I know here at Burness Paul, we are partnering with the Salveson Mind Room Centre um, on their new Neuro Inclusion at Work programme. And this program has been designed to help raise awareness of neurodiversity and how we can be a more neuro inclusive firm. And we will be working with SMC um, to offer manager and colleague training, review our internal policies and processes to identify and remove barriers and to implement also clear pathways for disclosure to ensure our neurodiverse colleagues feel informed and supported at work. And I think that this example of partnering with SMC is a, is a great example of how to educate and raise awareness in a workforce. And, you know, there's also other ways of educating and raising awareness um, throughout a workforce. For example, workforce training. Um, I touched on at the interview stage, you could consider giving the interviewers training regarding neurodiversity. But I think running neurodiversity training, including manager and colleague training and, and just across the workforce it generally helps to decrease the level of bias and makes people more understanding. Um, if possible, we also consider including neurodiverse employees and line managers in training sessions to discuss their real life experiences. Um, this is, of course, obviously subject to the individuals being comfortable and happy to do so, but often you know, lunchtime webinars that involve real life experiences get great engagement and are really powerful. I know here we do a lot of um, lunch and learn webinars on, on various topics and, and quite often um, employees will speak on them and they generally do get really good engagement and, and really good feedback. Um, also considering having go-to people, so like neurodiversity champions or mentors and there's that means there'll be clearly identified individuals that can be contacted in the workplace and in addition to that you could also have internal support groups and networks so that along with your go-to people you could have an internal support group and network um, and also like in in the company's intranet you could include a page on neurodiversity and that could have links to helpful resources and um, that's always a good idea too some companies actually now have neurodiversity policies um, and that's something that you consider, could consider introducing and also reviewing 
other company policies and processes like internal ones you've already got to identify and remove barriers for the neurodivergent workforce. Something else, I guess, that I want to touch on and I think is really important is also pathways for disclosure. So you want to try to be able to implement clear pathways for disclosure to ensure neurodiverse employees feel informed and supported at work and are able to disclose the diagnosis if they wish to. I mean, that's obviously, you know, up to the individual um, if they wish to or not. But if, um, you know, employees, they might be worried about the impact if they do disclose a diagnosis and, and worry it will impact their career and their career progression and unfortunately you know fear discrimination and stigma so if a company can be open and be clear they have a supportive and inclusive approach this will hopefully encourage people to feel more confident to disclose a diagnosis um, so I think that's important as well but I also I wanted to end on emphasizing that there, there are benefits for everyone and having a neurodiverse workforce you know at, at the outset I emphasize that a workplace will clearly benefit from different perspectives from different ideas and ways of thinking and this does emphasize the importance of having a neurodiverse workforce and the fact it can help a company flourish so there are the real benefits for businesses for tapping into this talent pool of the neurodivergent community and you know, this is not just about a business being able to see that they have continued to grow their diversity inclusion agenda and they are adding neurodiversity to it. This this is an opportunity for businesses to attract talent and grow their business and become more open minded and become more innovative. Um, strengths that have been identified within the neurodivergent community include strong attention to detail, ability to spot patterns able to sustain deep focus, innovative way of viewing problems, um, characteristics of honesty and loyalty, excellent long-term memory. And it, and it is also recognised that within the neurodivergent community, there are people that truly excel in specific areas. Um, and recognised benefits of neuro-inclusive practice include improved management skills, improved access to untapped talent pool, improved innovation, and improved industrial relations. So, so building an inclusive workplace for neurodiverse workers benefits everyone. And hopefully some of those statistics that I mentioned earlier today will change for the positive and, and the short term future and, and start to improve. Um, and hopefully you found that interesting. And, and if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer these. Um, if you put them in the chat function, I think Katie is going to keep an eye on the chat function. Um, but also, if anyone would like to follow up with any follow up questions offline, I would also be happy to take you know emails from you and I can pick up with you separately. Um, but I don't know, Katie, is there any questions coming through? No, I think you must be clear because there's no questions coming through, but obviously we've still got time, so feel free to put anything in the chat box and we can address it at the end. Yeah, and as I say, like if anyone wants to pick up with me offline, then um, feel, free, feel free to send me an email and happy um, to come back to you direct. Okay, well, oh, sorry, oh. there is one question that <laughs> just popped up there from Angela. It says, I read about some organisations who are now providing interview questions in advance of interviews to all shortlisted candidates at the first stage of the recruitment process. As this appears to enable the attraction and recruitment, a more diverse range of people, including neurodiverse candidates. What are your thoughts on this, Fiona? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the points I touched on earlier about the recruitment process that you consider sharing um, the questions in advance. And that's definitely in terms of the, the recruitment process, something that I think is worth considering. And, and actually, if, if, they're, um, if those companies are sharing it to everyone, then you can just take that approach that you always share it to everyone. But I think definitely um, one of the biggest hurdles can be the recruitment process. I mean, I know I have a friend who, who is neurodiverse and um, he's now in a role and, and, and excelling in it, but but he found it very hard to, to, to get through that first stage of the recruitment process. And I think, had he been able to be given um, questions in advance, that would have been something that would have made him feel a lot more confident and empowered going into the interview process. So that's definitely something that, that I think is worth considering and I think can make a real difference. 
Thank you, Fiona. There's a second question popped up by Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Um, the question is, any thoughts on handling probation reviews with neurodiverse employees? Um, I think the, one of the things that I've like touched on when we've been speaking is I think it's all about communication and um, being open and, and, and not being scared to have conversations. So in terms of probation if, if it's questions about you know how they're getting on I think be up be open and, and have these communications with them if if you're meaning like if, if there's concerns about how they're doing in their role you know I think you, you still need to address that but obviously obviously be sensitive about it um but you know I, I I think it's just all about keeping the dialogue um open but I, I think you do you know if in the probation stage if you're saying that you're you're concerned you don't know if then maybe hit hit the the standard to pass the probation then I think it's about having conversations and, and and not shying away from that but obviously being sensitive to it and being aware that it might be the fact that adjustments need to be put in place and always being open and being mindful of reasonable adjustments that, that may need to be put in place and and having a conversation about that. I think there's one other question or comment um, from Claire. I think companies are always wary because the law on reasonable adjustments is not clear, such as high levels of absence, how much of the work to remove. So you never know if you're doing enough. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it's not um, straightforward when it comes to reasonable adjustments. And, uh, you know, it, it is um, sometimes can, it's hard for companies to know what, what, what to do. And But I think it's about about being open, looking looking that what, what could be done. And I think what I touched on when we were speaking earlier in terms of the reasonable adjustments, actually a lot of them aren't expensive. A lot of them are, are, are quite easy to put in place. Um, and they can be done like things like I'm seeing like the, the noise cancelling um, headphones, things like that. Um, and I think, you know, obviously the phrase is reasonable adjustments. The adjustments need to be put in place or what would be termed reasonable so it's not it's not anything you know in terms of adjustments your you, company isn't obliged to to put all of, you know say for example a, a, an employee asked you to do x y and z and you actually took a view that some of them were reasonable and for, i don't know say i know this is an extreme example but it would cost a million pounds for a company to put it in place for one employee you know what the reality is i don't think that would be reasonable um but I think it's trying not to, to, to shy away from those conversations and, and, and considerations. Um, and obviously, um, you know, if requests were made and, and a company was a, a, unsure if, you know, they think that's reasonable or a bit wary about it, then we can always seek legal advice. And, you, you know, we'd be happy, happy to assist um, as well. But, you know, the companies are under an obligation to make reasonable adjustments. So it's important to show consideration. And if adjustment can't be put in place, then I think you need a clear um, reasoning to why. Any more questions? Great, I think that's it. Well, great. Well, happy to, as I say, take any questions offline. You know, it's a, it's a topic that I'm really interested in and would be um, happy to speak to anyone about it. So please feel free to contact me. Um, and I'll pass over to Kerry now, who's going to chat about some interesting recent case law. Um, and then we'll let you all away to get your lunch. Thank you, Fiona. It was really interesting. OK, in my section, there's three cases I wanted to cover with everyone today. The first concerns redundancy selection and is particularly important when you're considering a pool of one. The second considered the interesting question of whether supporting Rangers Football Club constituted a philosophical belief for the purposes of discrimination protection under the Equality Act. And the third relates to whether share incentive plans transfer on Chupi, so no doubt covering everyone's two favourite things. So the first case is that of Mogain against Bradford Teaching Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. So the claimant, Miss Mogain, was employed as a nurse. Her employer, the Trust, also employed another nurse in a similar role on the same grade. Now, both were engaged on fixed term contracts, albeit importantly, with different end dates. When the need for redundancies arose, the trust decided that Miss Mogain would be selected for redundancy solely because her fixed term contract was due to end before her colleague's contract. Now, Miss Mogain was placed in a pool of one and she was consulted about alternatives to dismissal, but was ultimately dismissed. 
She was not, however, consulted about the decision taken to place her in a pool of one based on her contract expiring first. So Miss McGain then raised a claim of unfair dismissal, arguing it was unfair to dismiss her without any consultation on the reason for her selection or any consideration as to an alternative process. The Employment Tribunal at first instance held that dismissal was fair and that the trust's decision to select her solely based on the contract expiry date was within the band of reasonable responses. Now, in my view, that was always an interesting or rather questionable decision given its in inherent unfairness. So Ms. McGain appealed and in contrast, the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that the decision to dismiss was unfair it held that in order that consultation be genuine and meaningful, a fair process requires that consultation takes place at a formative stage when an employee's view has the potential to influence the outcome. So in circumstances where the choice of criteria adopted has the inevitable result that the selection to dismiss is made by that decision itself, consultation should take place with the employee before that decision is taken. The EAT also commented that the implied term of mutual trust and confidence requires that employers do not act arbitrarily towards employees when determining redundancy selection. In my view, the judgment is a little confused at times as to whether it relates to the choice of pool or the choice of selection criteria, which are, in my mind, two separate steps. If the employer had first decided what work was diminishing as a first step, they would likely have identified a wider pool, including both the claimant and the other employee. They would then have had to consider selection criteria, including the expiry of the fixed term, to decide who should ultimately be dismissed and would have been required to consult on that particular point. And had they taken that approach, it may have remedied the unfairness in their process as the claimant would then have had a chance to comment and potentially influence the outcome. From my perspective, the key question with this case is how far do we extrapolate from that decision? What does it mean in practice when you're considering making a unique role redundant? Well, I think it's fair to say that employers do still enjoy a wide discretion when assessing the pool for selection. The question will be what work is diminishing and provided it can show that it genuinely applied its mind to this, pools of one are still possible where you are satisfied that the rule is unique and not interchangeable with others, such that it's fair to consider the individual in isolation. I think the rub here was that the other employee did a similar role and that the claimant was not chosen because she was in a unique position, but rather solely because of the fact that her fixed term expired first, which was arguably not the right question to ask. As such, in that scenario, the obligation to consult extended to the decision to place her in that pool of one. Therefore, to conclude, while a pool of one can be fair in appropriate circumstances, it should not be considered where there is more than one employee without prior consultation. And where there are different avenues available, this case serves as a useful reminder that no decision which determines the outcome of a redundancy process should be made without an opportunity for the employee to comment at a formative stage on the basis for their selection, both in terms of the pool and the criteria applied. The second case is that of Mr. McClung against Dusan Babcock Limited and others. So the claimant in this case, Mr. McClung, claimed that his support for Rangers Football Club was a philosophical belief within the meaning of the Equality Act 2010. Mr. McClung worked as a subcontractor for Dusan Babcock and claimed a manager there who, perhaps unsurprisingly, supported Celtic Football Club, denied him further work because of his support for Rangers. He brought claims for unfair dismissal and discrimination. Mr. McClung had supported Rangers for 42 years. He was a member of the club and received yearly birthday cards from them. He never missed a match and spent most of his discretionary income on attendance at games, as well as watching them on TV, being a subscription he had paid for. 
He told the tribunal that he was living his life in accordance with being a Rangers fan and went on to claim that his support for Rangers was a philosophical belief, saying, I don't go to church, I go to Rangers, it's a belief for me. So it's quite an interesting argument as it seems that being a Rangers supporter really was a way of life for the claimant. At tribunal, the initial claim of unfair dismissal was struck out at an earlier hearing as Mr McClung did not have the required two-year service to bring such a claim. However, before the claim for discrimination could proceed to a full hearing to be considered on its merits, the tribunal held a preliminary hearing to determine the question of whether his support for Rangers amounted to a protected belief under the Equality Act. The tribunal concluded that Mr McClung's belief was, um, sorry, while strongly and genuinely held, was not capable of being a protected philosophical belief. It considered the leading case of Granger PLC against Nicholson, which sets out the five criteria for determining whether a belief qualifies for protection under the Equality Act. Namely that first, there must be a belief that is genuinely held. Secondly, it must be a belief and not an opinion or viewpoint based on the present state of information that is available. Thirdly, it must be a belief as to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. Fourthly, it must attain a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance. And fifthly, it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, not be incompatible with human dignity and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. Well, firstly, the tribunal accepted that the belief was genuinely held, as Mr McClung was an avid fan, so the first Granger criterion was satisfied. However, the remaining criteria were not. In terms of number two, the tribunal noted that the explanatory notes to the Equality Act expressly state that support for a football club would not be a protected belief. Although the law had moved on since the legislation was drafted, the tribunal said that it would still be helpful to have regard to those explanatory notes in assisting the understanding of the legislator at that time, as well as their objectives. They said there's a distinction between a belief, which is the acceptance of something you believe to exist or to be true, especially one without proof, and support, which is being interested in and concerned for the success of something. Mr McClung's support for Rangers was akin to support for a political party, which case law had made clear does not constitute a protected philosophical belief. Thirdly, the tribunal held that supporting a football team was not equivalent to a belief in something weighty and substantial under the third Granger criterion and had no larger consequences for humanity as a whole. Rather, it held that support for a football club was more akin to a lifestyle choice. The claimant derived enjoyment from buying a ticket for the game, enjoyed the pre-match build-up, said that he woke up buzzing on match days and engaged in singing at the matches. However, these were matters which were personal to him and were subjectively important. They did not represent a belief as to a weighty or substantial aspect of human life. They had no larger consequences for humanity as a whole, and there was a wide range of Rangers fans with varying reasons behind their support, as I'm sure we'll all know, um, shown in different ways. Turning to the fourth Granger criteria, the tribunal held that there was nothing to suggest fans behave in a similar or cohesive way. The only common factor was that fans wanted their teams to do well. It therefore lacked the required characteristics of cogency, cohesion and importance. Lastly, the tribunal held that the claimant's support for Rangers was worthy of respect insofar as it was for him to decide which football team he should support. However, it did not invoke the same respect in a democratic society as matters such as veganism or the governance of a country, which have been the subject of academic research and commentary. So overall, quite a few hurdles for the claimant to overcome, and he only succeeded with one out of five. 
However, we have seen many successful claims made under the philosophical belief argument in recent years, including in respect of ethical veganism and Scottish independence. And I do think it's an area of the law that we will see develop. In my view, this is one of the biggest potential areas for considerably widening discrimination protection. And the reason being is that whilst a lot of protected characteristics cannot be changed or cannot be changed easily, for example, age, disability, sex, literally anyone could have a philosophical belief that could potentially qualify for protection. And also, it's not always easily apparent to an employer. Furthermore, cases such as this can be hard for businesses to take a view on and indeed for solicitors as ourselves to advise on. And the reason being is that the Granger criteria are all pretty subjective. So what this means in practice is that ultimately each case turns on its own facts and it's not easy to extrapolate from one case to another. Secondly, it also means quite frustratingly that different tribunal panels could credibly come to different decisions on a different day. The last case I wanted to touch on today was that of Ponticelli UK Limited against Gallagher. So in this case, the claimant, Mr. Gallagher, had his employment transfer to Ponticelli under the CHUPI regulations. Mr. Gallagher was entitled to participate in a share incentive plan, also known as a SIP, with his previous employer. However, participation in the SIP was not mentioned in his contract of employment. So when Mr. Gallagher's employment was transferred, his participation sorry, in the SIP ended. Ponticelli did not provide an equivalent scheme. Instead, as compensation for the fact that Ponticelli was not going to provide a SIP post-transfer, Mr. Gallagher received a one-off pay payment of around about £1,800. Mr. Gallagher raised an employment tribunal claim on the basis that his right to participate in an equivalent SIP scheme transferred under CHUPI. Now, to recap by way of background, Regulation 4.2 of CHUPI provides that on a relevant transfer, all of the transferers rights, powers, duties and liabilities under or importantly in connection with a transferring employee's employment contract pass to the transferee. The tribunal held that Mr. McGallagher's right to participate in a SIP of substantive equivalence or comparable value was part of his overall financial package and thus caught by Regulation 4. Ponticelli appealed, arguing that Mr. Gallagher's right to participate in a SIP had not arisen under or in connection with his employment contract and thus did not transfer under CHUPI. And the EAT dismissed the appeal. Now, if you ask me, that was always going to be a difficult argument to succeed with, given the particular wording of the CHUPI regulations. The EAT held that whilst Mr. Gallagher's right to participate in the SIP had not arisen under his contract of employment, his eligibility to participate was because of his status as an employee, because arguably how else would it have come about? Thus, even if his right to participate did not arise under his contract of employment, they arose in connection with his employment contract as per the legislation. The SIP was directly connected to his remuneration for his services as an employee and ultimately formed part of his financial package. Accordingly, Regulation 4 of CHUPI applied and the right to participate in a SIP did transfer. So what does this mean in practice? Well, transferees on a CHUPI transfer will need to carefully consider any share scheme that may be in connection with employment regardless of whether they are contractual or not, and whether they will be able to comply with CHUPI and offer a share scheme of substantive equivalence post-transfer, as well as presenting a significant cost burden, the obligation to provide a share scheme of substantive equivalence may cause considerable practical difficulties for a transferee, particularly if it does not operate similar share schemes for its existing workforce. The obligation may not be easy or indeed even possible for many, and thought would also need to be given to whether any replacement scheme is of substantial equivalence and what that term means in practice. 
What I think is interesting about this claim is that in the original tribunal case, Ponticelli had advanced arguments relating to the employer's right to terminate the SIP pre or post transfer, which were rejected by the tribunal and not pursued further in the EAT proceedings. Therefore, the EAT did not consider whether the obligations under the partnership share agreement were or could be validly terminated or varied pre or post transfer. On this basis, arguments relating to an employer's ability to suspend, vary or terminate an all employee share plan may well be an important factor in determining any future cases on similar share schemes. Practitioners had previously assumed that the CHIPI 2006 rules were intended to put both the employer and the employee in the same position insofar as possible. It follows that if the former employee had the power to terminate the plan, the new employer would have that same power and would be able to exercise that power by giving express notice to transferring employees that the plan is terminated and there'll be no right to participate going forward. So it remains to be seen how this particular angle will develop in practice. Now, lastly, I'm conscious of time, but there's just a couple of key legislative changes coming up just to put on your radar. Um, from the 5th of December, um, so a couple of weeks time, the ban on exclus exclusivity clauses, which are currently um, only applicable to zero hour workers, will be extended to include contracts in which guaranteed income is below or equivalent to the lower earnings limit, which is currently £123 per week. And separately, the proposed new right for unpaid carers to take up one week of unpaid leave per year is progressing through Parliament. Um, the private members bill had its second reading in the House of Commons back on the 21st of October, with the government announcing that it was backing the bill. Um, and the third reading is due to take place in February next year. So that's all from me. Um, if there's any questions, very happy to try my best to answer them. But obviously, if you would prefer to speak offline, then both myself and Fiona's contact details are on our website. So please do feel free to get in touch. No questions. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it was clear, <laughs> not just stunned you all into silence. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today. Really um, appreciate you coming. Um, and hopefully you can go now and grab a sandwich, enjoy the rest of your tea. So thank you very much.